asked him like why doesn't she talk she's so quiet he's going non-verbal well, neurotypical people want to join into a conversation no matter what the topic is almost mimicking their personality i will change well i think that you might be autistic rather than introverted or shy they're never going to be perfect that's as good as we're going to get right i have been overthinking this video and i just need to do it because i'll just keep overthinking it and i'll keep spiraling you know the drill today I'm going to be talking about the traits of autism and ADHD that I saw in myself um, and what led up to my autism diagnosis as an adult at 30 years old. Insane that I got this long without knowing how my brain worked. Basically, my assessor emailed me a list of questions, homework uh, to provide to her before my sessions with her. This alone was a little bit hard for me to do and hello ADHD. I was procrastinating it so much. As much as I wanted this assessment done, I really couldn't get myself to do this um, list of questions. And so what I did instead was I kept a notes app in my phone just day to day. If I noticed something or I remembered something, I'd add it to my notes app. And that worked so much better because it was much more convenient. I didn't have to remember a whole ton of stuff, um, just add to it when I could. After a few months, this list grew and my notes app was long. I am going to split these into categories <laughs> because there is a lot of these. So this is going to be, this video is going to be the social component. If you are experiencing any of the traits that I talk about today, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are autistic or you do have ADHD. It's just um, all of these traits put together and effectively really impact my life on a day-to-day -day scale. That's what makes them traits of autism for me. I have found that over my lifetime, maintaining friendships is hard. It's almost like I don't want to maintain friendships because they can be quite exhausting to me. I feel like in a majority of social situations that I've been through in my life, I am faking it, I'm putting on a persona, and I'd much rather be at home in most cases. Now realizing my neurodivergence, I am realizing that I can relate better to neurodivergent people, and therefore when I'm socializing with them, it's not exhausting at all for me. Following that, I get exhausted by social situations. I like the idea of them, but once I get there, I get stressed and anxious about how I am being perceived. One of the biggest traits of my autism is this idea of being perceived. I don't really know how to explain it, but just every time I step outside of my home or I'm in front of someone else, I have a huge anxieties around how I'm being perceived. Am I saying the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Am I standing correctly? Um, it's exhausting. That's why I like being at home because I can be me, I can be free, the unmasked me. So I often pull out of plans last minute. I for a really long time would get stomach pains every time I would have social events or things like that. I prefer one-on-one -on -one conversations as opposed to having a large group. I find them quite overstimulating and you often find me going mute. In those situations, I won't talk very much. That idea of being perceived coming into it again is really daunting and when you have a lot of eyes on you, that's why I don't like the group environment. I've often heard through the grapevine that I don't talk when I meet people <laughs> um, or if I'm talking to someone I don't know, I go quite quiet. I believe when I met Jordan's family, they asked him like, why doesn't she talk? She's so quiet, why isn't she talking? Um, and I would go pretty much mute whenever I was in those situations. I feel like that goes back to like not wanting to say the wrong thing, um, being just so overly stimulated from an environment. Usually there was quite a lot of people. I just didn't know how to engage in conversation, how to um, sort of get my word in. So I would just go quiet. 
Um, and now I know that that is going non-verbal. If I am in social situations, I will either stumble on my words, sweat profusely because I'm nervous and anxious, uh, bite my nails, pick my nails. I won't speak much and I'll be quite shaky and nervous. In saying this, my next one is that if there is a special interest topic, if I'm if the group is talking about something that I have a special interest in, um, for example, autism, I will be fine to talk. <laughs> one question in the assessment was um, if there was a group of people ne nearby you, um, you didn't know them, but they're having a conversation, would you want to join them despite not knowing what they're talking about? And I was like, no way. <laughs> No way. Um, and she was like, well, neurotypical people have that want to join into a conversation no matter what the topic is. I said, yes, I would love to join that conversation. If they were talking about autism, I'm joining in. But they were talking about the weather or I didn't know what they were talking about. No way am I going to join that conversation. That was a big like brain explosion for me. I was like, oh, doesn't everyone not really want to join in a conversation that they don't know the people and they don't know what they're talking about? No, apparently not. I am overly aware of how people react to what I say. I will watch their reactions to what I'm saying and I'll overthink what I'm saying to get a certain reaction. And in this way, I kind of camouflage into whatever the person I'm speaking to what suits them, almost mimicking their personality. I will change what I say, what I do, how I act to who I'm with. And that's masking basically. So <laughs> I've known that I've done this for a while. I can change my identity based on who I'm talking to, which is kind of a little scary. Um, when I got diagnosed, I was like, well, then who am I? Who am I? if I'm not all these people, soon to find out that being at home and being with my immediate family with Jordan, I am my own mask self and that is truly who I am. Obviously from what you've heard, I get social anxiety. Um, however, I recently have built a friendship group full of neurodivergent people and I don't get social anxiety with them. So I think when I was talking to the assessor, she was saying, do you think that you're shy or introverted? And I said, yes, I've always been shy. I've always been introverted, very quiet. And she said, what do you like with your family? And I'm like, well, I'm quite extroverted with them. I'm comfortable with them. And she said, well, I think that you might be autistic rather than introverted or shy. And I was like, that was another brain blowing moment where I was like, Huh? <laughs> I've always been labeled the shy girl, the quiet one. But in actual fact, my unmasked me, I'm quite extroverted. So it's interesting exploring all these things, isn't it? I feel like I am overly empathetic. I've always felt this way. I've always experienced emotions on like a hyperdrive level, um, especially when that emotion isn't my own. So for example, watching a movie or watching a documentary, listening to someone talk about something quite emotional, um, I'll take on their emotions as if they were my own. I remember one time we went to New York as a teenager, we went to New York and my mum said that I wanted to stop at every homeless person on the street and give them some money. And I was really distraught by the amount of homeless people that were there and the fact that I had to face them. Pretty much every 10 metres I went, there was a homeless person. And it was a really sad time. I was really affected. Um, obviously, we didn't have enough money to give to every single homeless person, but I really did try. I feel like my whole life I've gone out of my way to make sure people aren't feeling sad or aren't feeling embarrassed. I will take that on as my own emotion and try and change that. As a child, I never enjoyed group activities. These were hard for me, um, whether that be at school or I did dancing for quite a while. I remember being quite nervous and anxious 
in dance classes because of all the people that are there. Obviously, there's quite a lot of people in a dance class and that idea of being perceived as well. I believe that was a lot of anxiety. When I had group tasks at school, I really did not enjoy them. I much preferred having individual tasks and going to do individual activities. Like I enjoyed tennis. I did tennis for a while and it was quite a special interest for me. But it's something that I could sit on one side of the court. Yes, I was playing with someone, but I didn't have to talk to them. Um, They were too far away for talking. So it was quite an individualized activity and I, I really enjoyed that. Contrary to me being over empathetic, sometimes in some cases, I don't feel emotion. I think it's mostly when things happen to me, I don't feel the emotions. Um, For example, there's been some big traumatic things happen in my life that I just simply felt like I should be feeling sad in this moment. I should be feeling angry in this moment, but I was just not feeling anything. I hate being on the phone. (laughs) Text me anytime. I love text. Phone calls. Oh, they're so hard. So I worked in an office for quite a while and I almost burnt myself out from that because my job was to talk to people on the phone. Number one, I had anxieties over talking on the phone to people. But then number two, there are people in the office around me who could hear my phone calls. And that goes back to that idea of being perceived. I did not like people hearing me talk on the phone. I was like, I don't want them analyzing what I'm saying, if I'm saying the wrong thing. So what I would do is I would actually wait till lunchtime, wait till everyone went on their break to do my phone calls, or I would go to a separate room. We had like these meeting rooms that were sometimes free and I would go into there to do my phone calls. It truly burnt me out. And it was one of the factors in me leaving that job. I feel like with phone calls, I have to be super prepared before I actually make the phone call and I'll often write down scripts for myself in that job. I did write down scripts, what I should say, um, because usually if I got on the phone, my mind would just go blank and I would forget what I was calling about. I find it hard to stand up for myself and advocate for my needs. I'm a very much a people pleaser and I will put others' needs before my own. Um, and I really don't like confrontation. Um, obviously that's someone being angry at me and that is so, so bad for me. I don't want that at all. I feel like I have anxiety attacks every so often. And now that I'm learning a little bit more about autism, I'm probably leaning towards them being meltdowns. I just didn't know meltdowns could appear that way. And they, over the years I've thought, I'm having anxiety attacks. These are anxiety attacks and they very well could be, but I think a lot of them are meltdowns as well due to overstimulation, due to my sensory needs not being met. One time I was in the city on my anniversary date with Jordan. We went out to dinner. There was just a lot of people surrounding us and I actually just felt like like I just wanted to run away. I felt like I wanted to get out of there Um, we love Indian food and I loved being there with him and he was very much holding my hand along the way. Um, but I was just feeling quite overstimulated and like I had a racing heartbeat. My vision went foggy, like everything was just amplified and yeah, it took me a good hour to get out of that state. Jordan really helped me in that state. He sort of looked at me, he said, just concentrate on me. It's just you and me here. Um, it wasn't helping that there was crowds in the city and our restaurant was right next to where the crowds were. So even just thinking back on it, it just makes me feel so anxious. Rejection sensitivity. I almost said that wrong. Um, I fear being rejected. I have this huge fear of being rejected. And so I will go out of my way to please others so that I don't get rejected. In that, I'll overly focus on how in a conversation, how much is this person talking and I should talk the same amount as them? And am I letting them have a turn to talk? So when I'm in a conversation with someone, 
I'm constantly analyzing the conversation and it's so bizarre because I'll often forget what I'm talking about because I'm concentrating on are they getting enough turns to speak? Am I talking enough? Um, all the things. I don't know if anyone can relate to that. It's quite a thought process and I try not to do it, but I obviously always do it. Okay, that is it for the, I guess, social component of my traits that I saw. I'm going to go on in the next video about sensory sensitivities and sensory challenges that I have. There's quite a few of those. So I'll go on that into the next video, but thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any traits of your own, you can comment them down below. Any of these that you'd like me to sort of explore in more in depth, um, I can do that as well. But for now, I'll see you in my next video. Bye.